All right. Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, good people of God. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. All right. So we're going to ask if you would share this broadcast out as I'm doing myself. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome back for season two of Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shantae Charles. And we are test driving our Facebook Live on our Facebook page as well today. So we are um, on Facebook Live, on our Facebook page, Daring Dialogue. So if you have trouble today with our broadcast, you can um, go live over to our Facebook page as well today. Daring Dialogues is the Facebook page name. And we are excited because this is season two. We started out this year in January through June where we did season one and we covered a little over 100 episodes of our first season and we got a chance to talk about all kinds of things and so we are going to continue in that vein for season two. Um, Mondays we will be giving you some Monday motivation and we will be talking about discipleship. Tuesdays, which is today, we're going to give you a little bit of everything, just help you learn some different things. So today is our Teachable Tuesday. Uh, Wednesdays is going to be our Wisdom Wednesdays, and hopefully we're going to be uh, looking at some things to help you win in life. Thinking Thursdays, we're going to go into some theology. We'll be covering, uh, we'll be back at covering different world religions like we did in season one. We learned a lot of about other different religions, and we're also going to be looking at theology, the theology of Christianity in particular. Um, so if you are uh, interested in that, you're engaged in any kind of biblical study, you will definitely want to join us on Thursday mornings at 11 a.m. I want to say good morning to Lady Barbara, good morning to Pastor Ben, and those of you who are watching around the world. And those of you who will stop in to see what we are doing. So we are back with this season. And um, we're going to do another 100 episodes for season two. Welcome into the room. And those of you all who are familiar with our housekeeping, understand that we keep it clean in here. We keep our language clean in here. And so uh, we're going to ask if you respect that. And feel free to comment um, if you are able to in the comment uh, box. Feel free to do that. And um, if you have any specific questions that we're not covering in the broadcast, you can email us. Good morning, uh, Apostle. That's my husband in the, in the room this morning. If you have any questions, you can feel free to email me at reachshante at gmail.com. That, again, that's reachshante, and the spelling is right there above my head, at gmail.com. All right? So let's take a look. Also, Fridays, we will be covering finance and wealth building uh, Fridays, which means that wealth building is not just uh, money, right? Wealth building also has to do with your health. And so um, on my break, I don't know what, what has gone on in your life. I'd love to hear from you. If you, if you want to share what's going on in your life, you can also email me that. Um, but on my sabbatical, I discovered that I had some health concerns. And so I thank God for being able to take a sabbatical from Daring Dialogues because it actually helped to actually save my life. And one of these broadcasts, I'll go into um, how God saved my life and how a dermatologist actually saved my life. Um, but I'm happy to be alive. I'm happy to be in the land of the living. And again, if you're having any problems on our live stream right now, 
for Periscope, you can head on over to our Facebook channel, Daring Dialogues, where I'm also um, live streaming there today. All right. So let's get into our Teachable Tuesday for today. Many of you know we've been in this book here called The Daily Stoic, um, which are meditations on wisdom, perseverance, and the art of living. And I thought this was a pretty appropriate devotional um, that I read over our sabbatical time. And the topic is, life is a battlefield. Life is a battlefield. Welcome, Prophet Jonathan. Glad to see you back with us for season two. Life is a battlefield. Um, Epictetus said this, Don't you know life is like a military campaign? One must serve on watch, another in reconnaissance, another on the front line. So it is for us. Each person's life is a kind of battle and a long and varied one too. You must keep watch like a soldier and do everything commanded. You have been stationed in a key post, not some lowly place, and not for a short time, but for life. Hear me, life is a battlefield. And I got a good taste of that over my sabbatical. Um, let's just say that if anything could uh, come up that was a conflict, it literally came up, okay? Um, family conflict, like I said, health conflict, um, home improvement issues. It was almost as if um, the universe, and we know that God controls the universe, but it was almost as if the universe was saying, okay, she's going on sabbatical, Let's see what we can do to throw her off, right? Let's see what we can do to get her focused on something other than rest, okay? And so it was a struggle to actually take a break because of the different things that were happening and that were going on. And so I totally agree with this statement that life is, is a battlefield. Um, he says, you have been stationed in the key post not some lowly place and not for a short time, but for life. And we know that even though life is a battlefield, right? We have to take some time out to stop and rest. We have to take those, those times out to stop and regroup and recuperate, right? This is what we have to do. So we don't want to be the people that don't take the breaks or don't take the rest that we need. And then we find ourselves worn down to the point where we cannot combat what is coming against us. Okay. Because sometimes the, uh, and I don't know what my broadcast is set on today, but I usually don't have all these people coming in. Um, sometimes you will have in your life, well, the enemy will have you thinking that you have to keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going to the point that you simply break down. And so I believe that a part of your life and a part of understanding that life is a battlefield, right? A part of understanding that is knowing when to rest, when to regroup, when to, uh, you know, have your downtime, when to get some rest, because we don't want to be the people that break down in the middle of life, okay? We don't want to be that person. I know for me, um, I'm going to be hitting a milestone birthday this year, and I want to make sure that I'm in a place that I can actually enjoy that birthday, okay? I want to make sure that I'm doing what is necessary to get myself into shape, <laughs> It is the never-ending war, I agree, uh, Stun, if you want. It's the never-ending war against good and evil, all right? And so when you understand that this is a continual battle, you will not try, <clears throat> you will not try to be a person that is always fighting and not taking the necessary rest and breaks that you need, okay? Um, just in the time that I was off of Periscope, there were a lot of different people that passed away. 
um, there was a, a young pastor. I think he was younger than me. Um, he, he did not get up. I believe that the Sunday morning that he was supposed to minister and young guy passed away. It, it totally shocked people. And he was involved, um, in the Missouri area in a lot of the protest work, a lot of the activism work. Listen, if you are a person that is involved in activism and social justice movements, you especially need to take rest breaks. Why? Because activism is tiring. Activism, uh, it, it deals with your mental capacity. For some, it deals with them going out on all of these different trips and marches and things like that. So some of it is wear and tear on the body. Some of it is mental and psychological warfare because activists are not just fighting for justice, right? They're also being attacked by people who don't want justice for everybody. And then there's the wear and tear on the body. So if you are involved in activism, it is especially important for you to have people in your life that's going to hold you accountable, that's going to say, look, I know that this issue or this matter is important to you, but you need to rest. You can't go to every march. You can't make 10 speeches in one day. You've got to have some uh, wisdom, right, about how you are operating so that you can have longevity in whatever you're trying to accomplish. I'm going to say that again. You have to get to the point where you are operating in wisdom so that you can have longevity for the assignment that you're called to. And unfortunately, a lot of us, especially in activism and in uh, leadership, right? Especially those of you, us who are spiritual leaders, we need to make sure that we are doing what we need to do to take care of our bodies so that we can have longevity in what God has called us to do. Put some hearts on the screen if you agree. Okay? I don't want to leave early. I don't want to um, have my assignment incomplete because I was not taking the necessary precautions to take care of my body, okay? I only get one body to do this assignment in, in this life. I'm going to say that again. I only get one body to do this assignment in this life. <laughs> okay? So I'm looking for a new body. Yes, I am. But that new body isn't here yet. And until that new body gets here, that means that I have to I have a responsibility. Okay? I have a responsibility to care for this shell that I'm in so that I can fulfill God's work. As he uses this shell. All right. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to eventually put off mortality and, and put on immortality. But until we get there, I got to work with this mortal body. <laughs> Which means I have to crucify the flesh, right? And it's deeds thereof. I have to be to the place where I say, you know what? I love this particular food. I love this particular food, but I've got to crucify my flesh and bring it under subjection so that this particular food does not kill me. Mm -hmm. I love, right, staying up late at night, but at some point I've got to get to bed. I've got to turn off all of my devices that are going to keep on blinking and keep on, somebody's going to keep on inboxing me two, three o'clock in the morning. I'm guilty. I've done it to some people myself. All right. But at some point I've got to turn off my electronics so that I can get some rest so that my brain can rejuvenate. Okay. So I just want to talk to you today about a couple of things. He says, uh, the writer Robert Greene often uses the phrase, as in war, so in life. It's an aphorism worth keeping close because our life is a battle both li literally and figuratively. As a species, we fight to survive on a planet 
indifferent to our survival. Now, I think that's interesting because initially our planet was not indifferent to our survival. If we understand scripture, our planet was built for our survival. Our planet was created for us to be able to survive in it. But because of sin and because of man's greed, right? Our environment has been destroyed to a point <laughs> where we're trying to survive on a planet that seems indifferent to our survival. He says, as individuals, we fight to survive among a species whose population numbers in the billions. Even inside our own bodies, diverse bacteria battle it out. Okay. I had an, I just had an experience with some bacteria that was battling it out in my body and was trying to kill me. Thank God it did not. But that is the reality. Our bodies are so intricately made that if we don't do what we need to to take care of them, we will have systems fighting against each other. I hope somebody who is prophetic heard that in the spirit. Our bodies are so intricately put together that if we don't take care of our body, we will have systems that are supposed to work together in sync and in partnership with each other. They will start fighting each other. Mm -hmm. There's a military term in Latin called viver es militare, which means to live is to fight. I feel my help. <laughs> to live is to fight. If you're going to live, you are going to be dealing with something as long as you are alive. And I know we have this myth of eventually we're going to get to. Yes, I agree. I know we have this myth that eventually we're going to get to this place of just complete peace on earth. But the reality is, before we even got here, there was a war going on. There was a battle that was already started. There was a battle that was already initiated before we ever came on the scene. And so when you understand that you have been dropped off from eternity into time, into the middle of a war, you understand that to live is to fight. I'm preaching good. Mm -hmm. To live is to fight. If you're going to get up in the morning, if you're going to wake up every day, you have to understand that there is something that wants to come against you being able to make it for the day. And so because you know that and because you understand that, then you do what is necessary in order to have a plan that helps you to succeed in making it through your day. And I would hope that your military strategy includes the word of God and prayer. Mm -hmm. The word of God and prayer. Right now, I am in a season, and, I, and a couple years ago I went through a season where God had me in, in the prayer watch of midnight to 3 a.m. And I am back in that season again. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, God, what is going on? A lot of people know that uh, midnight to 3 a.m. is what they consider the overcomer's watch. It's the time of prayer where if you have something that you need to overcome, whether it's spiritual, physical, whatever, that is the time of prayer that you want to make sure that you're praying into. And so as I began to pray into that time of prayer, I honestly believe that a lot of things that tried to come against me while I was on sabbatical did not succeed because of that time of prayer. Okay. Things that I did not know, I could not have known that was going on with my body internally that, that could only be detected by an internal search. I was able to get to the issue in time so that it did not have further ramifications for my life. All right? So it's very, very important to understand that to live is 
to fight. To live is to fight. If you're alive, you're fighting something. Exactly. Put on your whole armor for the battle is not yours, but the Lord. So you're fighting for something. Okay. Sometimes it's what you can see. And sometimes it's what you cannot see. Okay. Today, you will be fighting for your goal and fighting against impulses, fighting the person that you want to be. Uh Uh-oh. You mean to tell me that the person that I want to be is not just going to automatically show up? (laughs) That'll preach all by itself. Listen, the person that you want to be is not going to automatically show up and reveal themselves. Somebody type, you've got to put in the work. You've got to put in the work, okay? If you want to lose 20 pounds, guess what? You're not going to just be able to close your eyes and pray 20 pounds away. You've got to put in some work. Hello. you got to do some exercise. You've got to change your diet. You've got to drink more water, okay? You have got to put in the work. The new you is not just going to show up by itself, It's not. The who you want to be is not going to show up by itself. It requires your active participation. You want a new position. You want a promotion. The promotion is not just going to show up by itself. You have to put in the work. You want to be in a healthy relationship. That's not going to show up by itself. You have to put in the work and it starts with you. So many times we're looking outward about what happened to us, right? Or, or what kind of people we have in our life. Listen, you can only attract what you are. Let me take a sip of this drink. You can only attract what you are. So if you're lazy, guess what you're going to attract? Mm-hmm. If you're late to work all the time, guess who you're going to attract as friends? You can only attract what you are. And so romantically, ladies, if you're only attracting thugs... Okay, you got to evaluate what is it in you that the thug is attracted to. Gentlemen, if you're only attracting young ladies who just want what's in your pocket, then you have to ask yourself, what is it about me that is only attracting women who want to drain me of my resources? What is it in me? That's attracting this because you only attract who you are. So if you want different people to be attracted to you, then that means you've got to start working on yourself first. I guarantee you, if you work on you, you will find that the people who are attracted to you will change. If you work on you, you will find that the people who are attracted to you, who are attracted to your vibe, who are attracted to your flow, who are attracted to your energy, they will change. So if the harlot is attracted to you, you've got to ask yourself, what is it about me that is attracting the spirit of the prostitute? Now, I'm not trying to do a relationship segment, so I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> we'll get to that on another day. But let's, let's move on, okay? Exactly. Do not waste your time, energy, money, and soul on someone who will not re- reciprocate. Listen, thank you for putting that up again, Prophet. If you work on you, the people who are attracted to you will change. I'm telling you. 
certain things, certain people began to drop off of my life. I didn't have to put an APB out. I didn't have to tell them they needed to leave. Okay? I didn't have to do that. All I had to do was begin to change what I was doing. This is Teachable T Tuesday. Welcome, peace of peace. And we are talking about the fact that life is a battlefield and that you have to come ready to fight. That to live is to fight. Agree. Be the model that you want to see in others. Okay? So one of the things that I knew when I was desiring to be married, I've been married for um, <clears throat> 17 years now. One of the things that I desired was a certain kind of spouse. But I knew when I was in prep mode that I was nowhere near, thank you, Mr. Ernie Perry, that I was nowhere near, okay, the person that I needed to be in order to be a good spouse. So what did I do? I had to put in some work. I had to study the word of God concerning marriage. I didn't wait for a preacher to tell me. I didn't wait for a marriage counselor to tell me. Okay? I am reading from it. <laughs> so I had to wait. And I had to work on myself. Okay? So I knew I was not wife material when I first started out studying it. I started looking at the requirements for marriage. I started looking at the sacrifice that it was going to take. I had to question myself and say, did I really want to be married? Was I willing to do what it took to be what, what the scripture calls a wife? Okay? Because marriage is not the wedding cake. Marriage is not the wedding ceremony. Marriage is not the wedding dress. I hope I'm helping somebody. Okay? So, I had to look at myself and I had to think, do I want to put in the work for this? I know I desire it. It looks like an ideal, but do I want to do the necessary work that I can be the person that someone is looking to marry. All right? So, again, today you'll be fighting for your goals. You're going to be fighting against impulses. Right? Yes, marriage is a unity into one. So I had to ask the question, do I want to be one with somebody else? Or am I okay being all one by myself? So we got to fight against impulses, right? That want to take us back to our old self. You have to fight against it. If you had a problem with alcohol, right? Or any addiction of any kind. Sometimes you have to fight the impulse. Okay? Congratulations, Mr. Ernie Perry. You have to fight impulses, that wants to take you back to the old you. If you were a person that fought a lot and that got into arguments with people and you are now a person who has decided I'm going to live a life where I'm not as argumentative, I'm not going to involve myself in fights that don't concern me, I'm not going to get into unnecessary conflicts, you have to fight the impulse that wants to take you back to being an argumentative, fighting, brawling person that answers your problems through fighting. Okay? So, the question comes, what are the attributes necessary to win wars in your life? Okay? Here are six of them. And we're not going to go into detail, but I just want to give you what they are. And you can study them on your own. Discipline. You need discipline in order to win the wars in life. You need fortitude. That's mental strength. Fortitude. You need courage. You need clear-headedness. 
being able to think soberly and to think straight. You need selflessness because there are going to be some things that's not going to be about you. Most of it is not going to be about you. <laughs> and that leads us to, you need to be able to make sacrifices if you want to win in life. You need to be able to say, I'm willing to give up this so that I can have this. I'm willing to give up things temporarily so that I can meet a, a permanent goal or a long-term goal. What attributes can cause you to lose wars in life? Cowardice, okay? Rashness, that means making quick decisions without thinking. Disorganization, okay? I know um, some of us creatives, we have a problem with that, disorganization. But you have to take it one step at a time and you have to be willing to change your old patterns so that you can be more effective. Sometimes disorganization, I know sometimes people look at it and say, oh, it's just because of mess or you're messy. But sometimes disorganization is not necessarily about clearing mess as it is about organizing your life and your time so that you can be more effective and so that you're not wasting time. Okay? Because as an artist, there are times when I'm working on projects or I'm working on a painting or I'm working on some writing and I have stuff everywhere. To the untrained eye, it looks like a jumbled mess on my desk. But to me, I can understand my organization. Okay? And so, again, disorganization is not necessarily about mess. It is about organizing your space and your time so that you can be more effective. So that you're not wasting resources, you're not wasting energy, you're not wasting time, but you're, you're using your time to the best of your ability. All right? Here's another one that can help you lose a war. Overconfidence. Overconfidence. We just saw what happened to the communications director in the White House. When he first came in, he came in with what? Guns blazing. All right? When I saw him come in with guns blazing, I could tell you he wasn't going to last long. You know why? Because there is one man in the White House that wants all the attention all the time. And he that's number 45. And so if you come in with guns blazing and you're trying to deflect from the attention that number 45 likes for, for himself, you're not going to last long, okay? In other words, the White House is only big enough for one big ego like that. Let me sip my drink. <laughs> you cannot have an ego that big and be in the same administration as 45. That wasn't going to work. Okay. So anybody who knows personality disorders knows that 45 likes to be the center of attention. All right. And Mr. Mr. Mooch was getting entirely too much attention drawn to himself when he came into that administration. So he had to go nothing personal. Just understand that the White House was not big enough for both of those egos. That's it. Overconfidence, weakness, and selfishness. As in war, so these attributes matter in daily life. That comes from the Daily Stoic. Excellent book. And we're going to check that off that we have read it. And we're going to move on. I see I'm doing pretty good for time. I want to share with you from this book, Uppity Women. Uppity Women Speak Their Minds. And I want to share with you today, two uppity women. <laughs> this is just a book. Yes, he is, unfortunately. This is a book, um, and it says, their critics call them uppity. Today we call them unswerving. These are some of the most outspoken, 
outrageous women, risk takers and do-gooders, academics and visionaries who have influenced the world from ancient Egypt to medieval Europe to modern America. These thinkers, lovers, advocates, and entrepreneurs reveal a sharp intellect and tongue, and they change minds and hearts, many of them. Whether determined to seek a new path, end injustice, or simply share their perspective, each led a courageous campaign on the battlefield, on the streets, and in their homes. From letters to diaries to books and speeches come 170 insights and insults on truth, love, independence, inequality, and more. All right. So, a couple of uppity women today. Uh, the first woman here we have is Mary Estelle, A-S-T-E-L-L. And um, she was a middle-class British lass. She received a thumping good education funded by a clearly quirky uncle. In turn, Mary got the bizarre notion that all girls should receive similar help. Now, you have to remember in history, not everybody thought it was a good idea to educate women. All right. So this is not a new concept. Um, we have seen this attitude. It still prevails um, in, in uh, some other countries, Africa, in some of the Middle Eastern countries. Right. This attitude that they should not educate women or they should not educate girls. And her uncle gave her an education at a time when it was thought that, you know, women basically were property. They didn't, you didn't really need to teach them how to uh, read or write or go to school and that kind of thing. A lot of people saw it as unnecessary since they would only be wives and mothers. So it wasn't really stressed that a woman should get a quote unquote proper education. All right. Historically, especially in England, some of the women, <clears throat> they would be educated at home by um, a nanny or something like that. And then they would the older girls, as they got older, they would go to um, what's called a, a finishing school, which I actually think we kind of need to bring back a little bit of the concept of the finishing school. This is where a young lady learned how to be a wife and mother. It was actually a school, right? They would go in and they would kind of teach them about housekeeping and how to entertain guests and those kinds of, you know, homemaking skills, so to speak. But they called it a finishing school. And once she left the finishing school, then she would be... Um, what we call released or chaperoned to go into what they would call in England, the marriage market. And this was a process where they would go to, um, <laughs> bring it back, please, where they would go to like different, uh, dance halls or, or, you know, evening events. And that is where the young ladies who were prepared to be married, that is where they would be introduced to the eligible young men of their day. And that is where if the man took an interest in the young lady and he saw her at this particular event, he would find out who her parents were and then he would pay a call to her parents the next day and he had to get permission from the parents to even be let in the house. This is when women still, you know, lived with their parents. And so he would have to go through this process of being vetted by the family, and we talked about this before, before he ever got a chance to say hello. I'm going to just sip this nice little strawberry lemonade. <laughs> before he ever got to say hello or be introduced to her directly, he had to go through some people. And we wonder why women get disrespected in our day because they don't go through anybody. Exactly. I do agree with that. The programming in schools right now, unfortunately, is programming children to, yeah, be a part of a labor force and not necessarily uh, own one. What if we did half of that? Exactly, Prophet Jonathan. 
So Prophet Jonathan, you know, you would be the person that would be interviewing any man that was interested in your sister. They would have to go through you, your father, your mother, before they ever said hello to her. So, I understand women's liberation and all of that, but certain things were, were actually put into place to protect women, to protect women from predators. Why do we have all these TV shows about the girl and, you know, I, I, wish, I wish that she had had somebody in her life and she wasn't telling anybody who she was seeing and next thing you know, she's, she's a part of a TV series, murder, murder mystery series. Because there was no protections in her life. There was no accountability to anybody. Nobody knew when she came. Nobody knew when she, when she went. Nobody knew who she was dating. Nobody knew if she was dating three guys, four guys, five guys, or six guys. So while I understand the concept and the need for independence, let's not throw out the need for protection from predatory men. While we own the independent kick. All right. I'm off that soapbox for now. <laughs> Mary Estelle said this. Since God has given women as well as men intelligent souls, why should they be forbidden to improve them? Mm. Say that again. Since God has given women as well as men intelligent souls, why should they be forbidden to improve them? Mary Estelle's proposal to train young female minds was a mashup of Protestant convent and scholarly academy. It was met with scorn. <laughs> I know, I know some of us think that in, in this 21st century that we're coming up with ideas that no one else has come up with, right? But even in her day, the idea of educating women was scorned, okay? Exactly. It was scorned by the people that she brought it up to. Scorned. But guess what? It was women who helped us get into orbit with the space program. You know, women whose souls were educated, who were not forbidden to improve themselves, even though they did have to face the color line, the color barrier. All right? So it was women that helped make the space program a success at a time that it needed to be a success. So though, so though during that time, we didn't see women on the television screen, right? They were putting up men as the face of the program, but the brains and the calculation behind the program was women. Just let that marinate. All right. So what happened? Exactly. Harriet Tubman created the Underground Railroad. Well, she didn't create it. She, I would say she successfully used it because there was a lot of people involved in it. All right. So look at this. What happened to Mary Estelle's idea that women should be educated? This is what happened. The final outcome was a bishop launched his own idea, a transparent Stealing of Mary's plan. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. Mary Estelle approached the people of her day with a plan to educate women. Mary was scorned for the plan. She was scorned for the plan. But a bishop in a church launched the same idea and it was received. 
How many of us know that still goes on today? <laughs> Here's another fun woman for you. Another fun woman. This one is Amelia Jinx Bloomer. Yes, he stole it. Amelia Jinx Bloomer. She lived, yes, but the man was praised. Of course, come on. And by the way, it hasn't always been a man's world. Just do do some. We're gonna we're gonna get into that as we go through daring dialogues. We're gonna find out about all of the women leaders that have been going on through world history. I know, it's gonna shock some of you. <laughs> Amelia Jenks Bloomer. She lived from 1818 to 1894. Mostly remembered for inventing the bloomers, the bloomers, the pants, Amelia Jenks Bloomer, that's where it comes from. She was farsighted and into comfort. The getup she urged women to wear resembled harem pants with a short overskirt. Yes, unfortunately, um, stun if you want. So, Amelia Bloomer created these type of pants that resembled harem pants with a short overskirt. American men were horrified, insisting the Bible was anti-Bloomer. <laughs> Even to this day, people still are arguing this particular thing. That the Bible is anti-bloomers or anti-pants. Most women of the time continued to struggle into the 20 to 40 pound hoop skirts and heavyweight dresses. So, this woman got tired of being cumbered about. Can you imagine as a woman putting on a hoop skirt that weighs about 40 pounds added to your frame? Plus a heavy dress on top of that. Apparel aside, Bloomer lent an intelligent voice to bigger matters. When legislators decreed that married women did not have free and independent souls and therefore no right to own property, Amelia went ballistic writing a editorial in the Lilly newspaper and revealing these male actions to a national audience. Let me say that again. Legislators decided that married women did not have free and independent souls, therefore they did not need to own property. Just think about that. All right? So when people say, I'm just following the laws. I'm just following the laws. I'm just following the rules. You have to step back and ask yourself, is this a righteous law? Or is this a law that is designed to suppress and oppress something? Because we seem to forget that these kinds of things were being enacted against women. All right. So if you are making a law declaring that women don't have free and independent souls just so you could take their property from them, that is unjust. But it happened. All right. Amelia Bloomer said this man legislates for us and now holds himself accountable for us. How kind of him and what a weight is lifted from us. She was being sarcastic. All right. So two women from our uppity women book who clearly, <laughs> clearly went against the grain. Let's see what we have for our time today. All right. We've got enough time to do one more book. All right. Hope you all are getting something out of our Teachable Tuesday today. 
I was going to get into this, but I'm going to have to tackle this next week. We're going to be talking about Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust. My, my. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk real briefly, and we're going to start leadership secrets from the Bible. From Moses to Matthew, management lessons for contemporary leaders. All right. As you all know, if you've been on Daring Dialogues before, you know that we are all about content. We are all about giving you, hopefully, material that you have not heard before. And we cover it from a, hopefully, inspirational standpoint and biblical standpoint. You will never have to worry about me cursing on Daring Dialogues. Um, we're not here for that. So we, we like to keep it clean. And I hope that you will join us again, those of you who are, those of you who have been with us. All right. It's not breaking in from my side, Pastor. You may want to come out, go out, and come back in. All right. So let me read you this preface or preface, as some say. <laughs> And then we're going to close for today. All right. Also this week, since we, this is our first week back, I do have some giveaways for us this week. So make sure you tune in and I'll tell you how you can participate in the giveaways. Leadership lessons from the Bible. What in heaven does the Bible have to do with leadership? Everything. The Bible is probably the most widely read book in the world. And it is revered for its religious precepts, guidance, wisdom, and beauty. Read carefully and with another perspective, it is also the greatest collection of leadership case studies ever written. Consider some of the managers and leaders of the Bible and the lessons they can impart to today's manager. Jacob, though inferior in strength to his macho brother Esau, was able to usurp his brother's birthright by appealing to the power behind the throne, which was his mother, to deceive the CEO, which was his father. All right. Joseph, for example, cast into corporate exile because of his brother's jealousy of his close relationship with his father. Exactly. Jacob was forced to join the opposition, Egypt. There he was able to infiltrate the court, use his influence with Pharaoh, and ultimately bring his family and tribe to live with him where they became a mighty force. However, the merger of the Israelites with the Egyptians soon became rocky, creating a whole new set of leadership problems. Moses inherited those leadership problems, and he was a leader who spoke so poorly that his brother Aaron had to deliver most of his speeches for him. So Aaron would have been our, our contemporary speech writer, right? Or, or campaign writer. He had to write his speeches for him. But the strength of Moses' vision and his commitment to Israel's mission made him the ultimate visionary and leader for a people who would have to follow him through adverse circumstances. Many modern corporations experience these conditions but few have been condemned to wander in the desert like Moses was for 40 years. All right. Joshua, Joshua who succeeded Moses and that transfer of power is an example of, get this, thorough succession planning assisted by divine intervention. It would take a great and inspiring leader to replace Moses and lead the Israelites into the promised land. Joshua's motivational genius and strategic planning helped the Israelites literally knock down fortresses. Samson, everybody has just about heard about Samson, right? He is one of the best, what we would call a negative case study in history. He possessed great physical strength, but he had tremendous blind spots. And where was his blind spots coming from? His libido, his sexual appetite put out his eyesight. Somebody needs to type that. <laughs> Don't let your sexual appetite put out your eyesight. 
Hello. So he had blind spots in his interpersonal judgments, right? He was really bad at making judgment calls about when somebody meant him no good. The person he most desired was actually the person he had most to fear. Think about that. The person he most desired was the person he actually should have been the most afraid of who brought about his downfall. Samson was literally blindsided by an enemy he thought was a friend who also happened to be a member of the opposite gender. There are a lot of lessons in this story for today's business leader. For those of you who are just coming in, this is what we're reading up from. Leadership Secrets of the Bible. Job had more troubles than any modern corporate executive, yet he stuck to his faith and his vision. His case study can teach the modern executive a lot about sticking to your vision despite obstacles, suffering, and doubters. Because how many of you know if you lead anything, you're going to have obstacles, you're going to endure some suffering, and you're going to have plenty of doubters. You're going to have people who say, I don't think this is right. I don't think this is going to work. This may not be the time for it. You may not be the person for it. And if you know that God has called you to do something, you have to turn, tune out the noise. When you realize that someone is not going in the same direction as you, learn how to just tune them out. I know for some of us, we cannot get away from physically people who doubt us. Who am I talking to? Some of you want to escape. You want to get away from them. I know. I've been there. But guess what? You can't escape everybody. You're human. <laughs> as long as you are on the earth, you're going to encounter at least one or two human beings that you probably want to escape from. And I don't care where you go. All right? So you cannot go through life thinking that you're going to have an escape route every time you don't like something. So there's going to be times where you're going to have to be amongst something or be amongst a situation where you're not going to like it and you have to learn how to tune out what you don't like so that you can get done what you need to get done. So sometimes that's tuning out people Sometimes that's tuning out what's happening in the environment that's not conducive to your purpose. If you can't get away from it, you're going to have to learn how to tune it out and keep going. All right. And of course, Jesus, Jesus, the son of a carpenter born in a manger, rose to found the most populous, what they're calling religion on earth. All right. Jesus' communication skills were consummate. He was able to communicate new and revolutionary ideas using parables instead of direct explanation. All right? He was able to ha handle loaded questions like Pontius Pilate saying, you know, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus says, well, you say that I am. The Sermon on the Mount is a beautiful example of motivational communication that influenced not just the people who were on the mountain, but it is still influencing people to this day. His work with the disciples was some of the most astute team building ever accomplished. How many of us know people or know leaders that were able to bring together a group of men from different walks of life to work as a team that finally learned how to work fully as a team after Jesus was off the scene. Cause yeah, most of us have been in an organization where everybody appears to work as a team, right? While the leader is present. <laughs> but when the leader is away, what is it? When the, when the cat's it, when the cat is away, the mice will play, right? 
Exactly. Very few leaders, very few leaders feel like they can leave their team and it not, as Pastor Ben put up there, and it not disintegrate into chaos. This is why, going back to our beginning topic, life is a battlefield. This is why some pastors will not leave their church. They won't take a vacation. They won't take a break because they don't feel that they built the team that will not fall apart without their presence. I'm preaching good. I know I am. Pastor, you need to stop making ministry about your leadership. Uh Uh-oh. Pastor, you need to stop making the ministry about your leadership alone. So, challenge for the leaders. If you have not taken a break this year, we are in the eighth month of the year. All right? We got one quarter to go. If you have not taken a break, if you have not taken a weekend, if you have not taken, I mean, just a a one-night stay (laughs) somewhere, please do that. Please do that and allow your team to get some experience with not having you micromanaging them. Some of your team is not going to tell you, but they are upset and they are tired of your micromanagement. You will get more out of your team when you stop standing over their shoulder. Gosh, I'm preaching. (laughs) Listen, you will get more out of your team when you stop standing over their shoulder, micromanaging everything that you have set for them to do. So if you gave them an assignment, you gave them a deadline, you gave a department in your, in your church, something you, you vision cast it with them. You sat them down, you told them what you wanted. And then every time they turn around, you are undoing their progress or you are micromanaging them. You're creating the frustration. You are creating the frustration. And guess what? Because they love you, because they respect you, some of them don't feel it's their place to tell you that you're micromanaging them. So count me as telling you for them. (laughs) okay you're micromanaging the people in your ministry if you give them something to do trust that they can do it let them know that hey if you if you find yourself stumbling on something if you find yourself coming to a dead end right come back to me and let's see what we can do but don't stand over their shoulder through the entire process because that signals to them a lack of trust in the fact that they can actually carry it out. All right. And people want to know if they are on a team, people want to know that they can be trusted with the vision. All right. I hope that helps somebody. I know that I am over my time. So let me stop here. All right. In this book, exactly, people do not need you to hold their hand. And a lot of leaders don't realize how many people are frustrated by their leadership style. All right? So in this book, we're going to cover honesty and integrity. He's going to give real-life examples, business leaders, some of the things that um, they went through. All right? Purpose, kindness and compassion, humility communication, performance management, team development, courage, justice and fairness, and leadership development. These are the books that we're going to be in, all right, for Tuesdays, for Teachable Tuesdays. We'll be in Leadership Secrets from the Bible, and we're also going to be in Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, 
All right. A lot of people don't know some of the things that this book talks about. So if you are interested in what was Africa like before people invaded it, pillaged it, did all these different things that they shouldn't have done. And how does that relate to what's happening now? How does that relate to what's happening with black Americans in America now? We're going to get into that on Tuesdays. All right. I hope that you got something out of today's Daring Dialogue. We're going to talk a little bit this week also about how you can become a sponsor and what will come with that sponsorship. I do have some things in the works. So if you're interested in that, um, please email me at reachshante at gmail.com and you can find out a little bit more about the squad that I'm creating. And it's going to be called the We Dare Squad. And um, there's going to be some specific things that we will cover um, with you and things that we will offer with you as a sponsor for Daring Dialogues. So I want to say thank you guys for coming back on. Thank you for uh, bearing with me as I went a little bit over time today. We want to keep it to 12 o'clock in the future, but I'm glad to be back. Thank you for putting that up for me, Mr. Ernie Perry. And I look forward to our Wisdom Wednesday. We've got some more books that we're going to be going through and covering. I want to give you content that you have not heard other places. All right? So that is my goal. All right? So I hope that you have a great and wonderful day. Take care and God bless. Glad to be back.